For the last few weeks, I have expected Carly to dump Drew upon Jason's return, but it was Drew who preemptively struck and ended things with her. And Carly barely fighting for Drew pretty much validated everything Drew said, that Jason would always come first, and she'd always turn to Jason over him when she was in need. He went on to note that Carly's marriages have all failed on some level, but Jason remains consistent in her life and her number one, and she's his. That conversation felt like an important clue, which I'll touch on in a few paragraphs. Drew's talk with Willow about breaking up with Carly was awkward. Yes, Drew's the savior of Willow's life as we have to hear about every so often, so she'll always care about him and empathize with him. But to tell him he deserves better than Carly was a wow moment. Did Willow just diss Carly, just a little there? Also, Michael won the award for the best reaction to the news of Carly and Drew's breakup. Wow, that's too bad, delivered with zero emotion. We all feel that way, Michael. Two seconds after breaking up with Carly, Drew's in the gym working out with Jordan, bonding over their troubles, and setting up a meeting to see how Aurora and the city of Port Charles can work together. We the manhunt for Jason was on, and when they didn't find him at Carly's, Anna had a hunch where he'd be, and of course it was the footbridge. Why is Jason going places they'd expect him to go to? Does he want to get caught? After jumping over the bridge, he wound up in the Quartermain boathouse and was discovered by Danny, who brought in Michael, who brought in Nurse Willow to help him. First, she's dissing Carly, now she's breaking the law by helping a fugitive. Willow's walking on the wild side this week hit did poor Joden do to get saddled with Drew. I don't think anybody asked for this when Michael noticed Jason came back with a full religious arm sleeve, he asked, what happened to you? Ignoring what in the hell was with the tattoo, Jason explained he survived that cave-in on Cassidane Island only to be kidnapped by two men, taken to a room with no windows and ordered to work as a military operative as something was being held over his head. He couldn't say who hired him or what was being used against him. Later through his own flashback, we learned Jason was taken to Quantico and forced by John, not Jagger, Cates to work for the government, and it was evidence of RICO violations which carried at least 20 years in jail being held over his head. Okay first, John Cates. I'm not surprised though because I somewhat suspected he could have a hand in this. So all his claims of wanting to protect Sonny, not wanting to be a criminal like Sonny and leave him to die at the hands of the gunman, were all a crock. Is he using Jason to take out Sonny as the biggest F you to get his revenge for what happened with Karen? Or, perhaps Brennan stepped in and thwarted the initial op. Though Jason did say he has to finish the man who gave him the job, and the consequences would be something he can't live with. That brings me to the why and what. I'm guessing the Rico evidence isn't on Jason or Sonny, but Carly. Going back to Drew's speech, Carly and Jason are each other's number one, and they would do anything for the other, so is this to keep Carly out of prison? Perhaps these violations are from when she took over Sonny's business when he was off in Nixon Falls. It's the only thing that makes sense to me right now. A lot of viewers have been wondering why few people, other than Carly, Joss, and Michael, were willing to give Jason the benefit of the doubt that he didn't shoot Dante. Anna finally came around and began to think there was something in all of what was playing out that she wasn't yet seeing. With Sonny and Sam, I think they are having a hard time overcoming the fact that Dant was injured in the fallout, and they need answers. Sonny is also grappling with the fact that Jason is working with the shooter who was trying to take him out. Sam, meanwhile, was dealing with the fact that Jason chose to stay away from his kids. By the way, has no one checked in with Jake on how he's feeling about this? Anyway, I can understand why not everyone is willing to give Jason the benefit of the doubt, especially with what evidence they have. And that squabble between Carly and Sam over Jason's guilt or innocence gave me some old-school feelings about how Carly used to be a big problem between Jason and Sam. I especially loved Sam telling her sister, I don't want Carly to go to jail, well, Friday's but right now, sure brought a big curveball. Hater's replacement hip has been poisoning her slowly and appears to be what is responsible for her being crazier than normal these past few years, such as becoming a serial killer. So they basically brain-tumored her, but without the brain tumor, because they did that with her son. Is Heather about to go free? Oh, sweet Jeebus what fun this could bring to Port Charles. Plus anything that allows Allie Mills to stick around as Heather I'm here for. Though will she still be a zanny when clear of the cobalt poisoning? Oh, and Heather's question to Laura about how similar Kevin and Ryan are in bed was hilarious. This is why I love this version of Heather. Alexis fans have been clamoring for her to get her law license back for a long time now 
and it finally appears we have new writers who are going to make our dreams come true. Friday's episode had Diane suggesting she could get the disbarment reversed and asked Alexis to become her legal partner. The question is, whose last name comes first in their firm's name? The scenes over the vape between Jake, Finn, and Liz were no surprise to anyone who lived through the 80s and 90s. Every single sitcom had that very special episode where some kid was caught with either cigarettes or a joint, and it always ended up being their friends. I will say though, Finn and Liz were tolerable, and they are always better when their kids are involved. The never-ending story of Marshall's misdiagnosis finally seems to come to an end, and it all was due to a racist and opportunistic doctor. I'm glad to see them at least using this story to tackle racism and the fact that some doctors abuse the medical system. But now that it's over, can we move on to something new I'm a fan of Nina, but I'll call her out when she's wrong, and she was damn nasty with Alexis and poor Gregory on Friday's episode. Sadly, Gregory told Alexis Nina was partially right, and he's unable to live up to publishing standards due to his ALS, and has quit the paper. Between Gregory going and Nina taking over, it really is looking like Alexis is headed back to law where she belongs. A colleague here at the site joked if Dex wants Joss to let him go, perhaps he should stop getting naked around her. So, true. And though I did not like Nina's actions towards Alexis and Gregory, I was all for her shutting up Carly Jr. and revealing she once saw Dex sneaking in and out of Cyrus' room dressed as an orderly. Next week's blow-up between Dex and Joss should be good. Oh who am I kidding, it will just end up with them in bed Agin Blaze's mom reaching out to have breakfast with her and talk seemed like she might be open for an honest discussion, but nope. Oh boy did she only make it worse for her daughter by suggesting she was experimenting with Christina after the trauma of what she endured with Link. That's up there with the old, you just haven't found the right man excuse. She refused to listen to Blaze who has stated she's gay and she's been with other women. As much as I squirmed at what Natalia said, this story is playing out to a lot of truths people believe when it comes to gay people and therefore is important to tackle head-on. That's all for my opinions on this week's episodes of General Hospital. As always, agree or disagree, leave your own thoughts in the comments below.